Hey everyone! I've got a brand new narration of some spine-chilling stories. Let me know what you think of the new narration style in the comments below. Don't forget to subscribe and like this video. Have you ever heard of imaginary friends? You know, those invisible creatures that children would create to provide an artificial friendship for themselves? It's funny to think of how real they seem to a child when everyone knows it's just a figment of their imagination. It's almost as if they were real, except after a while, this friend dies down and you never hear about them again. Usually because the child lost interest or had just grown up, but even something so childish and friendly can have a dark side. You just never see it. When I was in the fourth grade, I never had a lot of friends. Actually, I had no friends at all. Everyone just didn't like me. I tried making friends, but they would just turn me down for whatever reason. Every day I would eat my lunches alone and spend my recesses sitting by a tree, watching how much fun everyone was having. I specifically remember how bad I wanted that, to the point where it was unbearable. After many failed attempts of acquiring a friendship, I realized that it would just be easier to make one. The plan was foolproof because this friend couldn't say no. I was a very creative child back then, so it wasn't hard for me to create an imaginary friend. Her name was Suzanne. She seemed to be around my age and had straight blonde hair and freckles that pasted her cheekbones and nose. She was so friendly well to me anyways because no one else knew her. I spent every second of the day with her. She sat with me at lunch and we would come up with stupid jokes about school and talk about how fat my teacher was. And during recess, we would play tag. I guess no one noticed me talking to myself or running around the field alone. She even came home with me. Susan and me were best friends throughout the rest of elementary school. By the time I hit middle school, I took note of reality and noticed how childlike an imaginary friend was. Eventually, I stopped talking to Susan and went on with my day normally. But Susan wouldn't leave. Every now and then, I would see her in the back of the room or walking behind me down the hallway. Every time I glanced at her, she smiled as if she was excited to be around me. Another thing I noticed was that she aged with me. Susan didn't remain as a nine-year-old. She started out as she grew up, just like me. I came to the conclusion that I couldn't get rid of Susan because she wasn't, wasn't an imaginary friend anymore. She was a figure that silently followed me who I had absolutely no control of. I didn't mind because she wasn't getting in the way of anything at the time. She managed to stay with me when I began high school. By that time, I made a few of really great friends who Susan had an immense hatred for. I would hear her mock them and give negative input to anything they said. She didn't like the fact that I friends with someone besides her. She didn't hate me for it though. She didn't even hate me for ignoring her for the past few years and continued treating me as if I was her best friend, which apparently I was. Susan started to become more sinister and vile. It seemed as though she hated everything besides me, which had its consequences. Remember one time I was asking my mom a question while she was on the phone. She was cooking something on the stove and had her back to me while I was sitting at the kitchen island directly behind her. I called her name about three times before Susan hit her. I remember the amount of shock I felt at that moment. How did Susan hit her? This whole time I believed that I had somehow gone a bit crazy and couldn't get rid of a childhood apparition, but it seems as though Susan took on her own physical characteristics. My mom turned around a bit angry at me and asked why I had hit her. I couldn't say it was Susan, I was 14 years old. She'd think that I'm crazy, so I just told her that I was sorry, but I'd forgotten what I was going to ask. I was still overcome by what had just happened. Rising had trouble sleeping that night. I didn't know whether or not Susan was an actual being. She has a mind of her own and could physically interact with everything, but no one sees her. Could they possibly just be ignoring a real person? No, it's impossible. I made her. She never existed before the fourth grade. Soon after that, things started to get worse. She started to trip and push over people she didn't necessarily like. She even hit a few of my friends for making friendly insults towards me. I started to become somewhat fearful towards her and a bit uneasy when I hung out with my friends. This continued up until I was in my sophomore year for college. I was hanging out with my friend Morgan at her apartment one night. I was there because we were working on a project together, but we waited up until the last minute to complete it, so we had to get it done within the next two days. It was a fun night and Susan was nowhere to be seen, so I wasn't as uneasy as I usually would be. Considering that Morgan was my absolute best friend, whom I trusted the most, I decided to tell her about Susan. It was kind of awkward telling her because I've never told anyone before. That, and she wore the skeptical look on her face while I spoke. What are you? Insane or something? She chuckled. I started to feel a little restless. I'm not insane. She's real. These things actually happened. You have to believe me. I preach for myself. Look, whatever you're saying, I don't want to get into it. 
There's no way an imaginary friend can come to life. This isn't an RLL Stein book. You need to get a grip of yourself. She said, I couldn't help but feel left down. My own best friend didn't believe me when I know what I was saying was true. Arrived soon after that. Susan was still nowhere to be found, so I started to consider that I might actually be crazy. The next morning, I was awoken. By three forceful knocks on the door, I wiped my eyes as I went to open the door. When I answered it, I was able to make out two policemen through my foggy vision. They told me that I was being token in for questioning and led me to the back of the police car. Washington, I had no idea what I was being questioned for, and I figured it was just for a stolen item or something of that matter. I was horribly wrong. They told me that Morgan was killed last night. Apparently, her roommate found her bloodied corpse upon coming home later that night. According to a few witnesses, I was the only one who was with her before that. I tried telling them about how I left and that I couldn't possibly be the one who killed her, considering that she was my best friend. They pointed out that the only trace of another person was me, so it couldn't have been anyone else. I knew, deep down in my gut, I knew it was Susan. Rye found myself in prison for life afterwards. I saw Susan for the first time in a while after that, and I knew I couldn't ignore her anymore. What are you? I asked. She chuckled, and a big grin stretched across her face. I'm you, she answered. I never spoke to her again after that, but she still remained by my side even in prison. Every day I tried convincing the guards that it was Susan, but they'd shrug it off. Soon they started giving me pills to cope with my insanity. I know I'm not insane. Susan exists, and she killed Morgan. It wasn't me, you have to believe me. I was Susan, she's real, she's not an imaginary friend. She's real, she's real, she's real. I know she is, she has be. You believe me, right, don't you? I've told you everything, so you have to believe me. You have to. I need to get out of here. I can't take it anymore. I don't know how I'll escape. I might have to kill a few guards, I can't though. But Susan can. This is very spooky story about Game Boy. I'll never ask for anything else again, I swear, Mom. As kids, we've all said it at one point. We find something that seems the most amazing item in the world, and we just have to have it no matter what. For me, it was the newest handheld a Game Boy Color. It was the most beautiful thing to a six-year-old, especially when all my friends were getting theirs, growing up with four brothers and sisters and not especially well off. My parents did their best, but we struggled to get by most of the time. They did their best to give us comforts and toys, but new electronics were out of the question. Hell, we were still working off an old television that still used rabbit ears. I was the youngest of the five of us, so that meant a lot of hand-me-downs as well. I was used to it, but still held some resentment to my siblings and of course still begged for the Game Boy Color. They said they would do their best, bless their hearts. Shortly after my birthday, my mom and dad presented me with a box. I was surprised, but they said they had found something they knew I wanted very badly, and I had been good. My heart raced with excitement as I tore into the box, but sank into the pit of my stomach. It was not a Game Boy Color. This poor excuse for a handheld was a badly abused original Game Boy. It looked like it had been bitten and melted by something in the corners, as well as stained. Up on top, a strange camera stuck out of the cartridge inserted inside. When I picked it up, it read Game Boy Camera. They'd somehow managed to find it with the crappy little printer as well, complete with fading printer paper. You see? Daddy and I found it at a garage sale. It's exactly the kind you wanted. It even has a cool little camera to take pictures. They said far more excited than I was. Really brassy. I'm not sure if it was the fact that this was the first thing that had ever been given to me first, and it still was someone's used piece of junk, or that they had no actual idea what I had wanted, or maybe they had and just decided it was too much so a replacement would suffice and I'd never know the difference. But in my utter disappointment, I threw the worst tantrum I'd had since I was a toddler. I tossed the box on the ground and cried my eyes out, screaming how they were awful, and I didn't want this and I wanted my Game Boy Color. Well, you can imagine how that turned out. I got a good whooping from my father in front of all my siblings and a long lecture on gratefulness and how hard they work. A punishment for my selfishness, they gave my gift to my brother Ryan, only a couple years older than me. I was so angry, I didn't care though and was happy to be rid of the thing. Ryan, being the jerk he was, teased me about it endlessly. It was a few days after that, that he figured out the camera and printing on it. He would tease me from his room, talk about how he got to play with the cool system, and I was too little and bratty to ever touch it. I would either yell back at him or slam the door to my room and ignore it. Shortly after though, I heard him leave his room and call out to our mom, claiming the printer was acting weird. She was busy making lunch and told him it was probably due to being used and to keep trying and see if it would fix itself. I heard him go back into his room, then go back out a little while later, saying it was probably busted and that he was going to go to his friend's house. 
wondering what was wrong with it. I snuck into his room and found the papers lying on his bed. He'd taken photos of himself, making weird faces into the camera. The game system had been turned off as expected. The first few pictures were normal, then they changed into those strange faces that everyone knew about. The way the printer paper was stained. They looked even weirder. As I looked down at the later pictures though, they looked different. Obviously, the camera in the game was not the greatest, so it was sometimes hard to see details of someone's face, or it would look blocky or blurry. The later pictures, however, seemed to change. It wasn't just scribbles or silly words written on his face. His features seemed to change, and there were dark spots around his eyes and mouth. His expression didn't look goofy anymore. Instead, it looked scared. Each picture seemed to change it more and more. Eventually, the pictures changed to where it didn't even look like he was holding the camera anymore, but that someone was taking the picture of him. He got farther and farther away, and what seemed to be a horrible story unfolded. It was showing Ryan running from the camera. The last picture was showing Ryan's face half missing, dark pixels spilled out from the side of his head and lying on the ground. Why I didn't know what to think. I didn't know the little camera was capable of things like this. It frightened me immensely, and I jumped from the bed and ran to my mom telling her about the pictures. She didn't believe me and got angry I was playing with it after my behavior. She scolded me and sent me back to my room. I was too nervous to be angry though. I wonder what was wrong with that Game Boy. Why did it print those pictures? I was immensely relieved when Ryan came back home that night for dinner. He seemed fine and after that night, I convinced myself it must have been a problem with the system since it was so beaten up, some kind of error. At some point later in the week, Ryan tried again to take pictures. I heard him call it a piece of junk and then chuck it into a drawer. He threw all the pictures he had taken in the trash can. I didn't think much of the Game Boy and the camera until the week after. I had been coloring in my room when I heard a terrible scream from outside and the sound of brakes squealing to a stop. Immediately, we all jumped up and ran outside to find out what had happened, along with our neighbors. The sight that greeted us all still is burned into my memory. Ryan had gone to walk across the street to his friend's house, just as he would any other day. A man had come speeding down the street and hit him. He'd been pulled under the car and his head half crushed under the tires as the man hit the brakes. My older brother's brain and skull were splattered under, a pool of blood soaking into the street. I still remember the cry of agony and horror. My mother let out in the rage and grief in my father's eyes as he pulled the man from the car and shouted at him, asking him what in the hell he had been doing to hit a child. My sisters pulled me back inside, trying to comfort me and shield me from the sight. But the damage was done. I'd seen exactly what the picture had showed me, and I knew that Game Boy had been the cause. In my naivete, I tried to tell them, hoping they would believe me. They didn't believe me at all, and it made one of my sisters fall apart. The next few weeks were miserable. My parents were inconsolable, and my mother could barely take care of the house and us. My eldest sister, Andrea, took over her role and struggled with it, angry with us and dealing with her own grief. She also took over cleaning out Ryan's side of the room that he shared with my other brother. At some point, she found the Game Boy and the Game Boy camera and asked if I wanted it. I told her it was cursed that had it killed Ryan. She said that I was being cruel to our parents by turning their gift. That was meant for me into a guilt trip and that I needed to stop being so selfish. The funeral for Ryan caused even more money stress on the family and slowly, even at the young age I was, I could see they were not able to handle any of it well. I did my best at that point to keep out of trouble and didn't say anything more about the Game Boy camera. I don't know when she took them, but at some point, I guess she'd needed a distraction from trying to hold up the house. I went into my sister's room to find a missing sock and thought maybe it had landed into their clothing. Her trash can had the same printer paper in it. An ice cold sweat came over my body when I realized I couldn't stop myself. I reached in and looked at the pictures, they were the same. Andrea's face was slowly transformed into looks of horror and fear before showing her in a grotesque and terrifying position that I could only assume was a clue to how she would die. In the ending pictures, her face was barely recognizable and her skin was black. I was definitely sure now. This thing had to be destroyed. I thought to myself that maybe if I could destroy it, I could save my sister from the same fate. I tore her room apart searching for the Game Boy. Eventually, I found it and the printer. As I held it in my hand, something chilling happened. I turned on. The screen flashed the logo before it began to make noises and music. The sound was wrong, as though it were being played backwards. I had been looking straight at it and suddenly my face appeared on the screen. It began to print. In my panic state, I went to shut it off, but found the button was down already. It should not have been running. I then proceeded to rip the printer paper out and the game out of the system. The Game Boy began to spark an error while the printer spewed out ink all over my Andrea's bed. 
I felt it heat up in my hands and dropped it, watching the screen begin to smoke and the sparks fly out from both the Game Boy and the printer. After a minute or two, it seemed to die. And needless to say, I got in major trouble when my sister came home and found her bedsheet stained with ink and the system broken. My parents were furious and forbid me from going out with friends at all, as well as no TV. I was now considered very irresponsible and not allowed to touch any of my siblings' things. But it didn't matter though. I had saved her from a horrible fate and the curse system was gone. So I thought. I think back and realize that of everything I did, the thing that may have saved me was not letting the printer finish. Six months later, my sister was killed when she was driving home and slipped on something in the road, crashing her car and being trapped inside as it caught fire. When the police came to my parents, they had told them that she was burned beyond recognition, and the only reason they knew it was her was because she was driving my dad's car. I couldn't save her. I didn't dare tell my parents about the pictures. I don't think they would have believed me anyway. Years have passed and we've grown up. My parents never really recovered from Ryan and Andrea's deaths, and they have struggled immensely. The three of us take care of them now, though we still have the old rabbit ears television for comfort's sake. There's still one thought that haunts me though and makes it hard to sleep at night. I never found out what they did with the broken Game Boy, the camera and printer. I pray to God every night that the damn thing made its way into some kind of trash compactor or is tangled with the plastic floating in the ocean. I fear that they still wanted it to have use and donated it or sold it for parts. And someone somewhere's repairing it and putting a new paper and they will see what it was trying to print of me. This chilling story happened to my friend. And now I'm going to tell you about it. I was jolted out of sleep when my five-year-old son, Kevin, jumped on top of me. I let out a little yelp, both from the shock of the impact and from being ripped out of a deep sleep. A little disoriented, it took me a few moments to figure out what was going on. Now jumping up and down on the bed, Kevin yelled, Fuzzy came again. Fuzzy came again. I sighed, rubbed my eyes, and checked the clock. It wasn't even six o'clock in the morning yet. Kevin continued to jump ecstatically around the bed. By now, my husband was awake and very cranky. He looked over to the clock and seeing the time released a frustrated moat. Jesus kid, can't you wait until at least six? He murmured sleepily. He too had been sleeping soundly. Fuzzy came again. I told you he would. Kevin was too excited to care what time it was. It could have been one in the morning for all he cared. He's back. He's back. Fuzzy, as he called him, was what we assumed was Kevin's imaginary friend. He described him as a fuzzy, colorful creature that arrives in magical mist through his window every night and they play together. Kevin claimed that he could change colors and even shape, but he was always fuzzy. My husband and I both dismissed this as an imaginary friend phase, as we lived in a somewhat rural area outside of a minor city and there was no one around to play with. Every morning, he would tell us what he did with fuzzy last night. Sometimes I felt the need to check on Kevin at night, just to make sure everything was alright. The main reason I didn't was because Kevin was a very light sleeper in contrast to me and my husband who were very heavy sleepers and I didn't want to run the risk of waking him up. Kevin had stopped talking about Fuzzy a couple months back so we just assumed that he had grown out of it. I didn't see anything wrong with Kevin bringing Fuzzy back. I was happy as long as he was happy. I was a housewife. My husband worked in the city and was gone pretty much all day, so I cared for Kevin as he wasn't in school yet. It did get rather annoying after a while, constantly being bombarded with stories of Fuzzy all day. I smiled at Kevin's enthusiasm, but deep down I felt a sense of dread welling up at the idea of Fuzzy returning. I got up out of bed and left the room, leaving my husband to deal with Kevin and went downstairs. While making breakfast, I decided to check the newspaper. A car crashed on the interstate and no body was found. A rich lady donated some money to the state for park improvement or something, claiming that their current state was simply unacceptable. There was a short editorial on why kids are doing poorly in school and parenting suggestions on the topic. Later that day, I was in Kevin's room cleaning up. It smelled funny in his room. In fact, the last time I remembered it smelling this way was the last time Kevin was talking about fuzzy. I thought about it for a moment, but decided to just dismiss it as just fermented body odor from him jumping around on his bed with his imaginary friend. I decided to open the window as it was giving me a headache. Looking out, I saw Kevin out in the yard playing with some of his toys. It had rained last night and the ground was soft and muddy, so I made sure to warn him not to go near the mud. I lowered my head to withdraw back into the room, but noticed something on the ground beneath the window. See your two holes about a foot or so apart? They weren't that big, so I wasn't too concerned. It just bugged me as I couldn't think of anything that might have made them. I looked up to ask Kevin if he knew what they were. He might have made them. He had moved somewhere else though, 
and I didn't feel like chasing him down to ask about something so menial. The next day, I was wiping down a window in the dining room, which lied directly below Kevin's room. That evening, something else occurred to me. I found Kevin in the living room. Hey Kevin, I asked, why does Fuzzy only come at night? You seem bored lately, and you never play with him during daytime. He simply shrugged. I don't know, he replied. He just doesn't. This was when things started to feel a bit off. It had never occurred to me before that Kevin didn't play with Fuzzy during the daytime. It was probably just his way of keeping Fuzzy in a more realistic light if he brought Fuzzy out to show him to us. He would see that we clearly didn't believe in the fluffy piece of air next to him. Yeah, that's it. That's why I tell you nothing much happened for the next week or so. I, my husband and I went to bed at 10 o'clock sharp as usual. We let Kevin stay up later if he wanted to, so he could play with his imaginary friend. We didn't mind the noise he made. In fact, if we were asleep, we didn't hear it at all. Hell, a train couldn't wake us up once we hit deep sleep. Every night, Kenny would say something different about Fuzzy one night. He apparently brought a cookie, which I strongly suspect he stole from the cookie jar. And another night, they flew through the clouds on Fuzzy's back. We were happy that our child's imagination was healthy. That feeling, that feeling that something was slightly off never went away. The next week, I had to start putting Kevin to bed at the same time we went to bed, and later on earlier than us, ye school was coming up soon, and I wanted him to be on a normal buyer rhythm so that he could wake up early. But of course, this disrupted his fuzzy schedule, and he would not go to bed without a fight. As days passed, it was becoming visibly obvious that he was not going to sleep when he was supposed to, and instead probably getting up after we fell asleep. Dark circles under his eyes formed, he was whiner than ever and almost impossible to deal with leaving me utterly exhausted every day. Needless to say, I had no trouble falling asleep that week. I was getting sick of my authority being undermined. I decided to stay up late one night in order to catch him in the act. I went to bed as normal, got up and moved to a chair, and after about a 30 minute period of sitting there, I began to dose off. I decided I would need some help in this stakeout. I crept downstairs to make a quick batch of coffee. The feeling that something was wrong, I never alleviated itself. It felt like my mother's instinct was going off, but I didn't know why. I stood in the kitchen, sipping my coffee for what seemed to be ages. Frequently glancing at the clock didn't help. I spent most of the time reading the newspaper, and every time I began to dose off, I got more coffee, accustomed to utter silence. I jumped a little when I heard a little tumpty coming from upstairs. The clock read half past 12. I had no idea Kevin had the capacity to wait for more than three hours just for a stupid imaginary friend. I quietly set my stuff down on the kitchen table and tiptoed to the stairs. I made sure to avoid the creaky steps as I slowly ascended into the darkness of the second floor. Just as I reached the top step, I heard Kevin's voice from down the hallway. Fuzzy. It was now blindingly obvious that Kevin was awake. I heard another thump from Kevin's room as I slowly made my way down the hallway. I thought about calling out his name and scolding him right then but decided against it as it would only serve to alert him to my presence and allow him to retreat under the covers and pretend he was asleep. The feeling that something was wrong grew from minor to almost unbearable. A soft hissing noise coming from his room was now within earshot. I reached the door, gulping, I silently gripped the handle, turned it, and pushed inward. As I was opening the door, Kevin's bedroom window came into view. It was wide open and in it, a ladder. I flung the door wide open and nearly fainted. There, in the middle of the room, was an incredibly hairy, naked old man, wearing a gas mask. He was feeding hallucinogenic gas up Kevin's nose. His stories would include making puzzles, reading books, jumping around, and cuddling. The one thing that was weird, though, was the fact that Kevin had, at first, told us that a fuzzy didn't want us to know about his nightly visits. A bit put off at first, I soon disregarded this as merely a child's need to feel special because he had a secret. An old man accused of pedophilia and using hallucinogenics and other drugs to lure children, arrested three months ago, was released from jail as there was not enough incriminating evidence. There was some sports stuff too, but I didn't bother checking that as I was never really into sports. The two holes caught my eye again. However, this time they were even bigger than before. At dinner, I decided to ask Kevin if he had been digging in the backyard. He said no so I figured it must have been animals or something. Just a little in the right kind of way. Kids enjoy being scared. They don't find loud and horrific things fun. But if something gives off a vibe of the perfect proportion of creepiness, it will turn a child's head and instead of triggering his uneasiness and cause him to back away, it instills in him a sense of adventure so that he may find out for certain if there really is anything from which to back away. Can Dandel Cove did that for me? 
Maybe it was the weird puppets. Uh, maybe it was the themes of haunted caves, murderous pirates, and skin grinding skeletons. Maybe it was the weird camera and sound quality. Whatever it was, I was five years old in 1971 and caught the pilot one day while mom was out running errands, and thus the dial was mine to turn. I came upon the show and was instantly hooked. I've been reading up recently. My curiosity reignited and my caution diminished about this theory that the show is just weak signal static and these rumors about this screaming episode that apparently earned the laughing stock in her crew an abrupt pull from the seas and the Channel 58 airwaves. Ooh, I can tell you right now, it wasn't just dead air or snow, however, I can't confirm the existence of episode 212 because I didn't get a chance to see it, or for that matter, any of the episodes in the second season. After all, they only aired once. This is the story of why I miss them. One Tuesday, September 21, 1971, I came home from school in my mom's clunky Volkswagen. Since there was nothing particularly interesting on in mom's eyes, she would forfeit the television to me for an hour while she rode on her exercise bike in the basement. And of course that day, just like several weeks leading up to it, the dial turned right to 58. Episode 6 of season 1, I would later find out was called Ship Crap. Tration. Appropriately enough, the premise involves Percy musing about the lovely song of the singing dolphins. A stock that was like one innings heard rhythmically cooing in the background, and winds up falling asleep at the helm of laughing stock, and apparently sleep steering, crashing her into a large, jagged rock jutting out of the waters in a corner of the cove. The rest of the episode involves Janice and Poppy frantically trying to repair their ship before it sinks, all the while fighting sleep. Eventually, they spot a strange tree growing near the peak of the mountainous rock and decide it would make great torchwood for distress beacons, so Janus goes to fetch it. On her journey, she begins to sleepwalk, which is how she comes across Susan Siren. Susan, like most of the other characters on the show, had a cheap but almost intentionally strange design. She was not a puppet, but an actress with her body and face painted a sea greenish pallor, her lips a vibrant orange to complement it. She was dressed rather well inappropriately for a children's show. Her breasts only obscured by a metallic brassiere, small chains possibly intended originally for necklaces, serving as the straps. Her bottom piece was also fashioned in this way, with a large, obviously paper mesh way chain attached to her iron panties, and the rock behind her meant to shackle her there. The top half of her head, including her eyes and nose, was concealed by a headpiece fashioned to make her look more cartoonish, but it also had a pale green skin, as well as orange hair and large, spherical orange eyes to match the lipstick. Susan Siren explains to Janinus that she was condemned to lullaby rock centuries ago, when a fleet of ships almost crashed due to her hypnotic, sleep-inducing singing. Janice laments that she cannot free Susan, but promises to return to visit if Susan promises to lure another ship without crashing it to the rock to rescue them. Susan agrees and sings a peaceful song about your hard work at sea, and how it's earned you a nap. That day I came home from school especially drained. I remember that much what had happened in kindergarten that would leave a five-year-old so exhausted as lost to time, but I remember being tired. So taking Susan's advice, I switched from a sitting position on the couch to a laying one and let my heavy eyes sink. Only seconds after my eyelids made everything dark. I heard the song end and Susan boast to Janice. Now watch this. My eyes fluttered open, eager to see what had happened, but I was somewhere else. The room was white as were the sheets on the bed I had apparently been tucked into. There were silver boxy machines surrounding me, beeping monotonously. A little tube poked into my arm and connected it to a hanging pouch of clear liquid. I wanted to touch it, but was afraid of the pain. I wanted to scream, but a large tube had been shoved in my mouth. I wanted to cry and struggle and kick down the walls, but I was too weak, so I settled for sobbing. <laughs> After a few minutes of that, a woman in a white dress rushed and they called for a doctor who simply studied me. But he did call my mother and after I was unhooked from all those machines and latched onto her, exchanging with her happier sobs, she sat me down to explain that I had been in a coma for nearly two years. So why is my curiosity only rekindled now? I suppose I never related to the show. The doctors never gave a straight answer as to why this happened to me. So who else could know of one? I only started looking into it again about a week ago, around a month after mom's funeral. I was going through some of her tax receipts when I found an empty envelope from NASA, dated December 29, 1971. The kind of envelope a check might arrive in. When I was in high school, my girlfriend and I would go to the mall. A lot. It wasn't something I enjoyed very much, but it made her happy, so I didn't complain. Every time we went, she would make us get our pictures taken in those photo booth things. You know, the ones where you put in two quarters or whatever and get a strip of pictures taken and printed off. It was kind of a ritual. She kept the best one from each visit in her locker. One time we went and the booth was taped off. 
I guess someone thought it would be funny to use it to take nude pictures of himself and then leave the strip in the booth. The parents of the little girl who went in next were not amused and the mall was going to be taking it out. I think that's an overreaction, but expected nowadays. Well, my girlfriend was pretty sad about not being able to get our pictures taken like usual, so we ended up just wandering aimlessly. She didn't really want to leave, but she didn't feel like shopping either. I bought us some ice cream hoping it would cheer her up, but she still was pretty depressed. Eventually, we ended up at the far end of the second floor. We almost never got over there as there weren't many stores either of us were interested in, but today we did. I noticed that there was an arcade there and that got me thinking. They tend to have a photo booth in them. I didn't want to say anything about that to avoid getting my girlfriend's hopes up, but I managed to convince her to go in. It was noisy inside, but mostly just from the games. There were only a few other kids inside and the owner sitting at a small desk watching some sports game on TV. We walked around the place and didn't see a booth. Saddened a bit, I suggested that we go and she started to say that she agreed when her sentence drifted off. I looked where she was looking and tucked back in a corner. There was a machine that said instantly developed photos peeking over one of the games. We nearly ran over to it, but were disheartened to find that it too was taped off. My girlfriend was really sad now and suggested that we leave the mall now. I hated seeing her like this and I thought to myself, you know what? Almost no one is in here and none of them are paying attention to us. So I went over, plugged in the booth and pulled the tape down. Raishi was shocked that I would do that, but then the joy of being able to carry on our tradition overtook her. One thing that was incredibly obvious about this booth was that it was much older than the one that we usually went to. It was beaten up, didn't have a touch screen menu, and only cost 10 cents a strip. We decided to do a double strip since it would still be cheaper than one of our normal ones. We put in two dimes and then it took our pictures. When the last one was done, we looked and saw that there wasn't a slot for them to be printed on the inside. It was odd, but I guess back when this thing was made, they didn't think to have them print on the inside. So we got out and looked at the sides of the booth and found the pictures. There wasn't much light inside the arcade, so my girlfriend picked them up and we were walking outside to see them better when we realized something. There was no sound anymore. All the games were running, but it was like someone hit the mute button on all of them. It creeped my girlfriend out and I'll admit I was unnerved as well. So we walked towards the exit a little faster, but we couldn't find it. Every corner we took just led us to another row of arcade games with flashing lights and no sound. Now we were both panicking, but I managed to be rational enough to figure out that. If I climbed on top of one of the machines, I would be able to get a view of the room. I went over to one and asked my girlfriend to give me a little support as I climbed it. I got on top and saw that somehow we had gooned further into the arcade. The exit was on the other side, I told her, and she calmed down a bit. I was trying to get down from the game when I thought something brushed my hand. I screamed and fell. My girlfriend tried to catch me, but I just knocked her into the machine and fell onto the floor. I wasn't hurt badly and I got up to tell her I was sorry. When I turned to look at her, I saw she was staring at the screen and shaking. I walked over beside her and saw that it no longer was showing the menu. No flashing and old fashioned arcade game letters. Was the message player two has no more lives. I told her that I must have started a game when I climbed up, but she shook her head no and whispered look around. Every game was flashing the same words. That really freaked us out, so we started running in the direction of the exit. We went around turns and turns of games, and it seemed we had been running far too long to have covered less distance than is contained in a shop in a mall. But now we could see it. Seven rows of games ahead, rising above the mall, was the exit sign. We stopped for a moment when we saw it, relieved and catching our breath. Then my girlfriend screamed. She spun around to look behind her and screamed that something had just touched her hair. We looked around but saw nothing. No one was near us, but there was something worse than the presence of someone else. The screens now all showed the words player one has no more lives. That was it, we were sprinting faster than we ever had before. Running towards the exit sign. We just had to get around three more rows and we would be out of the arcade. And then we saw something that brought us to a halt. There was someone standing at one of the games. He was one of the kids we had seen earlier when we came in recognized the clothes even though I hadn't paid much attention to him before. He was just standing there playing a game. After the shock of seeing someone else had passed, I thought I should call out to him. Hey dude, my girlfriend grabbed my arm and shushed me. Don't, she whispered harshly in my ear. Why not? What's the matter? Something doesn't feel right. Let's just keep going. We're almost out. So we walked past him, hugging the other side of the row of games. Something seemed wrong with him in the glow of the lights. I stopped walking and just looked at him. My girlfriend begged me to keep going, but I had to figure out what was wrong. I took a few steps closer and it hit me. 
his hands were on the controls the game was playing, but he wasn't moving at all. I walked closer and closer. All the while, my girlfriend was crying and begging for me to go back to her. I got to him, touched him on the shoulder, and shivered from how freezing cold he was. I asked if he was okay and walked beside him to get a look at his face. His throat was slit and his skin was paper white. Rap screamed so loud and so intensely that I hurt my voice. I turned back to my girlfriend and started to run to her when I saw that someone holding a hand over her mouth and a knife to her throat. I couldn't see the face, but the figure's hands looked like a man's. I shouted at him, let her go. The response was a laugh deep and gurgling. I tried to lunge at him to get the knife away from her throat, but I wasn't fast enough. He slid her open in one fluid motion. Blood sprayed out all over me, and I was frozen in shock. He dropped her body and brought the knife to his face. I was still shrouded in darkness, but I saw a tongue come out and lick the knife. That tongue was, wasn't human. It looked more like a giraffe, long and thin. I was crying now and couldn't think. Then he pointed at me and said, you wait there. You next? That voice, it was horrible. It was like two rough stones being dragged across each other. But what came next was worse. He bent down to my girlfriend's body yeah. and started sucking and the fatal wound. His mouth covered her entire neck and it made a horrifying squelching sound as he sucked the blood from her. I couldn't think, couldn't react with anything but more tears and a sighing cry. And then the noises started to stop. He pulled back and his mouth was extended like a trunk and it began to pull back into his face. When it was back to normal, that tongue came out again and licked the traces of blood off his lips. He pulled the knife out again and started advancing towards me. Part of me wanted to let him kill me. I didn't want to live with these memories, but that part of my mind was overridden by a more primitive section. The adrenaline poured out into my body and I ran. I didn't even know what was happening anymore, I just ran. Somehow I managed to make it to the exit. As I ran, I saw the owner still sitting at his TV, now blank and some still active part of my mind realized that his skin was far too pale and that there was a black line running along his neck. But I caught all of that in the few seconds before bursting out of the door and running into a woman outside of the arcade. Ray Slapley screamed, begging her to call the police, the paramedics. Anyone she screamed to at first I thought, because I seemed crazy. Then I realized that I had blood all over me. My girlfriend's blood. Eventually security came and the woman told them I had come from inside the arcade. One of them stayed with me and the other two went inside. They came back out and told a man with me to handcuff me while they contacted the police. What they had found was my girlfriend's body throat slit drained of blood. This was expected. I had seen her die. What I didn't expect was that hers was the only one, nor did I expect it to be found in the photo booth. But worst part, the piece of evidence that I can never comprehend. The reason that my mind was broken to the point I was considered incompetent for trial was that two strips of pictures found in the booth with her, they showed me slitting her throat. Now I spend my days out of my mind on medication in a psych ward, but sometimes I trick them into thinking I took my medication so that I can think for a while. And I always think back to that day. And I have an idea about it. I think that sometime someone else will go into that arcade. They'll find it empty except for the owner sitting there watching a sports game. A couple kids playing games and a beautiful girl sitting alone in a photo booth. And I wonder, will this person ever leave the arcade? They move again tonight. I lay and watch them seeing as it's all I can do. They slip and slide through the street lamp window, curtain shaded light, and I know my eyes have begun to fail. Or perhaps the eyes are fine and my mind is finally going from the pain and boredom. Dying is a lonely business. The shadows dance me to sleep and I dream again of Eileen. It starts out well more relived memory than dream. And I see her bent over that diner counter in a light pink poodle skirt, pointing to a slice of warm pecan pie and I laugh. A little sounds like my present day laugh. A harsh, phlegm-filled bark as the same old thought rolled through my head. What an ass on her. People act like we were all chaste and proper back then, but hormones never change. My domineering thought in those days was the best way to get her, or any girl for that matter, into the back seat of a 57 Chevy. She turns her curly, caracolored hair slipping down her shoulders and I scream myself awake. I cough up a lung and try to blink away the vision. Her face wasn't young and clean as it should have been, as it had been all those years ago. Instead, it was dark, ruddy, and rotted, as I imagine her to be now six feet down and moldering. The door opens and the creak sends a chill down what I can still feel of my spine. My breath stops held. It is only Joan, my home hospice worker, and not dear dead Eileen that steps through. Everything all right, Mr. Jenkins? She asks. Well, I mumble, God. When did my voice get so damn weak? Marisa Batchin's 79. My legs don't work and it's quite possible I've shit myself, so it's a resounding no. She chuckles. 
I always could make the girls laugh. I'll check you, she says, time for your meds anyway. Whoopee, I replied. Make it a double. Joanne does her business of cleaning up my business, jabs a long, thick needle through the thin skin of my arm and disappears. I close my eyes, but sleep doesn't come. My eyes pry back open and I catch my breath. The shadows have moved again. I know I know shadows move. I'm old, not crazy. At least not yet. The darkness pools into the center of the ceiling, no light to cast them that way. They stretch and form into a humanoid shape, tall and amorphous like a thin man in a shroud. Like death, I realize, I wonder if this is it. If so, break out the scythe. I'm too old to fear the reaper anymore. No scythe that comes. Instead, the figure cocks its head to the side, like a confused child and swirls into a ball again. I watch confused as a child myself, as the shadows split. I realize a scene is taking form in silhouette. A flat straight line of shadow runs across the ceiling. Other shadows arise from it, forming little more than stick figures, but people just the same. More and more lines move out and I smile. I know what I am seeing now, what the shadows form, even if it is just a drug or dying-induced hallucination. There was the ringmaster, top hat and all. He gestured to the right to a line in caricature, a man with a whip made of darkness dancing before it. There was the Tropius, a stick man. A Roman, I suppose, don't ask me the sex of shadows, flying through the air with the greatest of ease and cannons and clowns and little stick shadow monkeys and laughter like I hadn't heard in ages. The racking coughs come to remind me that all things, even laughter, require payment. The circus packed up as I wheezed the cloak back, cocking its head again at a different angle, almost one of concern. The coughing wouldn't stop, the H in my guts growing steadily worse from the strain as John threw open the door, the light from the doorway causing the shadows to dart to the corner of the room. We never use the room light unless absolutely necessary. It hurt my eyes. She pulled me up into a sitting position and the coughing finally subsided. Thank you. I wheezed as she eased me back down onto the bed. That's why I'm here, she said, now you try and rest. I barely heard her. I was looking at the ceiling at the shadows. The shadows encircled her head as she leaned over me, but there was no laughter now, no ringmaster. It had been replaced with writhing monstrosity of black tentacles around a gaping mouth filled with jagged shadow teeth. Centered in the mouth was Joan's plain-faced, mossy-haired head. I wheezed out no, as loud as I could, but it came as nothing more than a whisper. The mouth began to close. I had no idea if the shadows or whatever they were could hurt her, but I wouldn't let them if I could stop it. Joan just smiled, said, you rest now and turn to leave, undevoured. I concentrated on the shadows as she made her way across the room. They seemed to draw back from her presence as if in fear, the monster turning to a cowering boy, its arm extended, pointing as if in accusation. I don't understand, I whispered. The ball of shadow roiled, a move that made me think of frustration and did so until sleep finally took me. I lay waiting for the day to pass, same as all days now, filled with hot broth and bad TV. But this day also held anticipation. I didn't know if I would see the shadows again, but I hoped. Even if they were just the symptoms of an old dying mind. Finally, the sunlight crept its way out of the window. The only muted light left that of the street lamp outside. I sighed and closed my eyes, waiting for something I was sure would never come. I dozed off a half hour or so before I opened my eyes again. The shadow ball shimmered on the ceiling. The shimmering seemed to grow more intense as I smiled up at it. Then it split, a new scene for a new night. A western this time, with stick figure saloon girls and dueling cowboys, even a stagecoach robbery. The shadows recoiled as the door opened, spilling a crack of light into the room. Joan entered, syringe in hand. She said something, but I didn't hear. All my faculties were focused on the ceiling. The shadows swirled around her again, careful of the beam of light from the hallway. The monster was back, its mouth a silent roar aimed at Joan. Then the monster became the cloak of death, its silhouette head staring down at me, two open spots of ceiling for eyes. The image shook and I realized it was moving back and forth as if it was shaking its head, no. A hand reached from the dark mask, skeletal in its thinness, and pointed at Joan, and at the syringe that slid effortlessly into my arm. What's her um? What is that? I asked her. Just medicine, she replied. Just what the doctor ordered. Sure, sure, I said and watched her leave. As whatever it was coursed through my veins, I took a deep rattling breath and let it all go. Dying is rough. Being dead, not so bad, to be honest, at least not here. I've heard talk of somewhere else, somewhere I never want to see. There are lots of things on this side, not just people, but things that have never roamed our world. Alien is here and the baby we lost so long ago. And there are things here that just like giving the dying a few moments of happiness, even if they're taken before their time like I was. Though it's not easy to communicate with the other side, we can see and hear it all, if we want. As I watched Joan's trembling hands tie the noose, 
As the shadows on the walls around her cast reflections of horrid, sharp toothed things, I realize I don't hate her. At least not for the arsenic she pumped into my system. I was old and missed my wife, she probably did me a favor. That's not why the shadows and I did this drove her to this. See, I wasn't her first and I wouldn't be her last. Time is funny here. You can see it if you look hard enough. Even the future, possible ones anyway. And whether Joan had stayed in hospice or like in so many futures, went into neonatal care, it was always the same. See, I wasn't her first, but I'll make damn sure I'm her last. I know of an old Romanian fairy tale, highly unpopular even in its earliest iterations. It might be based on a particular event, or perhaps it is an extrapolation from existing Slenderman stories. The translation I'm most familiar with goes a bit like this. Once upon a time, there were twin girls, Stila and Sorina. They were brave little girls and had no fear of the dark, nor of spiders and other crawling things. Where other young ladies and even young boys would cower, Stella and Serena would walk with their heads held high. They were good girls, obedient to their mother and father and to the word of God. They were the best children a mother could ask for, and this was their undoing. One day, Stila and Serena were out with their mother gathering berries from the forest. Their mother bid them stay close to her, and they listened, as they were good children. The day was bright and clear, and even as they walked closer to the center of the forest, the light barely dimmed. It was nearly bright as noon when they found the tall man. The tall man stood in a clearing dressed as a nobleman, all in black. Shadows lay over him, dark as a cloudy midnight. He had many arms, all long and boneless as snakes, all sharp as swords, and they writhed like worms on nails. He did not speak, but made his intentions known. Their mother tried not to listen, but she could no more disobey the tall man than she could forget how to breathe. She walked into the clearing, her daughter shortly behind her. Stella, she said, take my knife and cut a circle on the ground big enough to lie in. Stella, who was not afraid of the tall man, nor afraid of the quiver in her mother's voice, obeyed what her mother said. Serena, the mother said, take the berries and spread them in the circle and crush them underfoot until the juice stains the earth. Though Serena wondered why her mother asked her to do such a thing, she obeyed because she was a good girl, Stella the mother said. A lie in the circle, Stila, though she worried she might stain her clothes, did as her mother asked. Serena, the mother said, and bid Serena cut her sister open with the knife. Serena could not, would not. Please, her mother said, if you don't, it will be worse. So much worse. But Serena could not, and she threw the knife away and ran home crying. She hid under her bed, afraid for the first time in her life. She waited until her father came home from the fields and told him of the terrible things she had found in the woods. Her father comforted her and told her she would be safe. He went to the woods, his axe in hand, and as he commanded, she stayed by the hearth waiting for his return. And after some time, she fell asleep. When she woke, it was to the sound of knocking on her door at the darkest hour of the night. Who is there? She said. It is your father, the knocker said. I don't believe you, said Serena. It is your sister, the knocker said. It cannot be, said Serena. I am your mother, said the knocker, and I told you it would be worse, and the door locked tight before her father left, fell open as if it had been left ajar. And her mother stepped in, her sister's head clutched in one bloody hand. Her father's in the other. Why, wept Serena. Because, said her mother, there is no reward for goodness, there is no respite for faith, there is nothing but cold steel teeth and scourging fire for all of us, and it's coming for you now. And the tall man slid from the fire and clenched Serena in his burning embrace, and that was the end of her. Driving home from a friend's house, you sit at a red light when you hear a familiar tone from your phone, sitting in the passenger seat. A text message, probably from your friend. You always leave things at their homes. Being a responsible driver and the lights still red, you open the message and wait for a moment for the image to load. Suddenly a photo pops into view, red obscured strange contrast and no text accompanying it, but the light is green. So you close your phone and go back to driving, wondering vaguely what that was and who would have sent you it. Perhaps someone accidentally took a picture of the inside of their bag or pocket and sent it to you. You're still caught wondering as you pull up to the next light. Also read in another little tone from your phone. You flip it open, hoping for an apology from a friend, but find yourself waiting as another photo loads on the screen. This one, still mostly red, but textured now with scraps of blue, yet still indiscernible. This time, it takes an impatient honk from behind you before you realize you can pass through the light and be on your way home. Closing the phone and continue on your way. You sit uncomfortable now as the tone rings again. At yet another stop signal, you pause, hesitate, and then open the phone. The picture now is suddenly much more clear. 
That scrap of blue seems to be the ragged edge of a bit of denim, half blood soaked and laying across a pile of entrails, torn straight through the back of a human torso. You can only see from the bottom of the shoulder blade to the tops of the thighs, but it's unmistakably human. Blue-white spinal bone smeared in blood, tubes of intestine trailing out between ragged-looking spinal tissue and gluing out of the frame of the picture. You choke back a throat full of bile and throw the phone back into the passenger seat, happy to be on your way again and dreading the knowledge that you won't be able to not look as you hear that tone again. There is some relief as you realize there are no more stoplights before you reach your home. But as you pull up to that red stop sign, the bottom of your stomach drops out and you feel a cold sweat build on the back of your neck. You have already picked up the phone, even before that telltale little tone has told you there is a message. The cell vibrates in your hand as you flip it open. Your mind on an autopilot, driving home with your eyes on the screen as the newest photo loads. Intestines piled almost artistically to the side of the body. Scalp ripped free and no hair discernible, and that sickening contrast of darkening red on blue. For some reason, you expected that even as you taste bile. On the back of your tongue, it's not as close or obscured. Flesh torn apart by God knows what means, torn denim, and blood soaked so far into the threadbare fabric of a hand-me-down couch. The one you have in your living room, you pull your car into park, hands shaking as you make your way up to your front door. You can't stop yourself now, your body's just doing as it normally would. But your finger frantically scrolls down the screen, finding no name, no phone number, and a time dated on the message three minutes from now. You put the key in the door as you try shrug off your denim jacket. Before I begin, there are two pieces of information you must consider. Have you ever noticed that whenever a mirror is reflected, into another mirror. After multiple reflections, it begins to fade into a darker and greener infinity. The mirror can be cracked or completely unblemished. It simply does not matter. The light will always disappear and greenify the deeper the reflection tunnel runs. But it is not wise for one to purposely create these tunnels, but for the curious, which I'm assuming you are, they are at least very interesting. Secondly, yes, your doppelganger does live as your immediate reflection on the surface of the mirror. The good news is they are harmless. They live as you do, as clueless to as you when they see you in their reflection. Why should they question your intentions when they have none themselves? They live with as much or as little peace as you do in a single reflection. It need not matter the day, place, or position of the moon for this to occur. Though the darker it is, the easier it is for them to approach. It would also be a good idea to note the precise time at which you begin for reasons that will be made clear later. You must have two large mirrors facing each other with roughly one meter between them. Stand between them and do not make a sound. In fact, the location you choose must be free from any extraneous noise. This is of the most up, most importance. They frighten easily, especially in the beginning. You must be able to see your entire reflection in the mirror you decide to face. Count as many frames as you possibly can over your reflection's shoulder until the greenness and darkness swallows, the last remnants of the reflection, depending on the amount of light in your location. This should take anywhere from 10 to 20 minutes. Feel free to take your time. As your eyes strain to count the lace visible frame, you should notice pale shapes emerge in the furthest green of the mirror tunnel before they retreat into their infinity again. This may just be a trick of the mind at first, but slowly you will begin to see them more and more frequently. Once they begin appearing at more and more regular intervals, you may notice an uneasy expression appear on your reflection's face, although you may feel your own face at ease. Step out from between the mirrors immediately at this point, exit the room you were in, and lock the door behind you. They have awakened. If on the second day you feel as curious as the first, you may repeat the same process as described above. It must begin at the exact same time you had started the previous day, hence having write it down. Those things that you may have glimpsed at for only a few seconds may reappear more readily if you have earned their favor. Your reflection may appear a bit shaken, but that is only a trick of the mind and nothing you need to worry about. Once you have finished counting back as many frames as possible, blink only once to refocus yourself. You should not close your eyes again. Not that you actually could if you wanted to. You may begin to notice that they appear not only in the darkest frame of the tunnel, but now in closer frames. Uh, you can't make out anything that could be considered a face, give or take the blur of what could resemble teeth. Don't let your curiosity blind you. Looking for human similarities in them is fruitless, even though you will continue to try to understand them. If ever they appear in any frame less than six away from your own reflection, they have become too comfortable with you and you with them. They have become too beautiful to ignore. You have become too focused on them to notice your own reflection, pointing warning you about the thing reaching through the mirror behind you. Monsters. Yeah, I know they aren't real. It's always a dude in a suit or someone playing joke. 
Well, that is all bullshit. I saw one and I know it was real. Cause it saw me too. Might as well start from the beginning. My older brother was a dick. Always getting what he wanted and blaming me for the stuff he did wrong. Our dad only parent we lived with would believe him instantly. I'm not bitter about it, but it is still a sore spot. I was rather skilled with technology and computers. My brother was more inclined to manual labor and punching people. Though we look almost alike enough to be twins, he is a year older. My father would spend a lot of time out, hitting on women and drinking. Every night he was out, my brother would go to his friend's house a mile or two away from our place. Since we lived in a small town, just out of range for most cell phones and a good hour from any police station or civilization other than the post office or general store. We were one of five houses in a four mile radius down in a valley. If you cannot tell, this is going to be something no one can corroborate. Anyway, one of those nights when my father was drinking and my brother was off doing something with his friends, I was sleeping on the couch in the living room. I had a hard time sleeping in my room in the basement when home alone. Just some personal issues with small spaces and no windows. This night helped get me over that. The TV was going. Something stupid on Adult Swim playing and I woke up to a weird sound from the door. My brother would get drunk or high and wander home around 3. 4 am most times he went out, but it was only midnight when I looked over at the clock. Thinking he had a fight with his friends or something? I hop up from the couch and tug my pants into place since they were a little too big for me. So I walked no shirt or socks or anything to the door and looked through the peephole. Nothing out there. With a shrug, I think it was a dog and walked back to the couch. The moment I sit down looking at the TV a moment before something catches my eye. Outside the window was a rather small shadow. Probably the dog that has been pawing at my door. I give a sigh, thinking about how that mutt could take a crap on the porch and I would have to clean it. Mm. I walk back to the door, glancing at the window the moment my fingers touch the knob. Every cell in my body locked up, freezing me in place. My skin started shivering, goosebumps formed on every inch of me as I tried in vain to move my body on will alone. I could not process this. Think for a full minute. Long, thin, and slinky, it was not a dog. Scales instead of fur covered it, black with some grayed ones here and there. Its tail made up so much of its body that it looked as if it had begun right behind the only two limbs it had. Hands. Not paws were at the ends of its arms. But the arms, those arms were wrong in so many ways. They had what looked like three elbows. The arms curved in a few different ways, making it look broken and bent. I could only see those hands because they pressed to the glass of the window, along with its face. Yes, a face. Human, almost, but the thing had no lips. Just a slit across the spot above its jaw. The eyes were solid black and the nose was just a bump with one hole toward the bottom. It looked like someone had taken a blank doll. It was just as still as I was, looking right at me while I held the doorknob. I thought it was some kind of joke, some kind of trick of the light. But the longer I stared at it, the less I could deny it was alive. I could see the fog forming from its nose, the way its body inflated ever so slightly with each breath. My eyes drifted over it, looking at each feature in horror and memorizing it. Burning that thing into me, black nails chipped and broken as if it had been using them to crawl around on. The slightest gap between the top and bottom of that slit across its face. My lungs were not working now. Tea was slowed around me as my brain got flooded with energy, but begging me to decide on fight or flight. I hardened my gaze, eyebrows furrowed in anger at this thing, and it just kept smiling. I let the knob go and slowly gained the ability to stand right. As soon as I squared my shoulders with that monster, the smile slowly faded from its face, passing all the way to a deep frown. It tapped the window one time with a broken black nail. A shudder ran through me before I could stop it. The beast gave another tap with its finger as that thick, black snake tail coiled around itself. But I didn't move this time. Instead, trying to think Dad's gun would be in the closet, but the shells were in his dresser. I would have to get to them both in seconds if I moved. That thing could come through that window easily. I knew it from the loud sounds of just one finger tapping. Like it could see the wheels in my head turning. It spread those long fingers, raking the black nails inward. Rails of scratches formed with a high-pitched sound till it made a fist against the glass. Shit! I mirrored its actions. Not sure why, but it seemed to confuse the thing. It spread its hand open again turning it side to side. Back of that too, it raised its hand up. Mine followed, the it touched its face. I cupped my cheek the same way. Then it twisted its arm into an O shape. Double shit. When I could not copy that movement, it went back to smiling at me, now curling and uncurling its arm as if it were mocking me for my lack of joints. This thing. Not only had it caused a fear in me I had never known, but now it was teasing me. This monster freak was acting like it was better than me. Without meaning to or any form of planning, I looked it right in the eye and said, 
At least I have legs. It stopped moving its arms and looked right into my eyes. Face gone into a blank slate again. Then in the worst, deepest, and most evil voice I could ever imagine, it spoke. And I have you. Diving backward into my dad's room, I slammed the door shut and ran for the gun. The closet door slid hard to the side, slamming loudly while blood rushed through my body. My fingers gripped the barrel and I all but leaped to the dresser, fishing into it with one hand and pulling three shells out. Erect and turned to the door, stuffing them into the 12 gauge and pointing right at the center of the door. It took me maybe a minute in total once I was in the door, but I was ready. I was gonna blow that thing to pieces. Arise had stayed there, holding the gun and waiting for five minutes. No broken glass sounds, nothing but silence. Then I whipped around, checking both windows. Nothing again. Four hours I stood there, ready to unload all three shells into anything that moved. Four hours I waited to see those twisted hands reaching for me. Then the front door opened. I turned around, still pointing at the door when I heard my brother call out, Hey, you up? I shakily opened the door, still holding the gun. Nothing in the window and my older brother popping open a can of soda. He was not drunk or high tonight, just kind of sleepy looking when he said, why do you have that? Well, I explained what I saw. I explained what happened and I begged him to believe me. He said I was just with him and went to bed, me begging him to stay up with me till morning. No dice. So I sat on the couch, shotgun in hand, looking at that same window till my dad got home the next day. He didn't believe me either. I slept in my room, no windows and only one door all day. And the next night I stayed down there. So I couldn't go into that living room again for weeks. My brother actually stayed with me all night one night, showing me there wasn't a damn thing to be afraid of. I don't know what people have told you or even what you believe, but there are things out there. There are things that want you hurt. There are things that can and will toy with you just for the fun of it. My advice, get a gun in a bunker cause that is as close to safe as I feel most nights. Then I looked at its eyes, those horrid black beads perfectly round and sticking barely off of its face. I could not tell if it were moving them at all. Then it did the creepiest thing it could have. It smiled, the pale, smooth cheeks creased as its mouth arched and gave me a hint of the teeth behind it. Not full rows of razors, like I had someone how expected, but broken human teeth. 